We're really glad to be back for another session, and this time we are bringing some panelists to the stage. First, though, uh, the panel is called Raising the Bar, and we're really talking and elevating uh, about talking about and elevating some of the change that's happening, both in a legislative capacity and also with some programs that have developed specific to maternal mental health here in the United States. I'm going to start by sharing with you what happened here in California with the legislative package that was signed by our governor in the fall. And before I jump into this presentation, I wanted to acknowledge our partner, Maternal Mental Health Now. Uh, I know we've got several folks from Maternal Mental Health Now in the room. Could you stand up? I'm not sure where everyone went. Well, you all will be my witness that we uh, uh, said thank you um, to these incredible partners. It was a journey. If you've been involved in a legislative uh, advocacy process, you know that crafting legislation and working with various offices uh, to uh, make sure that everyone can live with what is being proposed is quite an undertaking. So thank you, Maternal Mental Health Now, for your partnership. So I wanted to uh, start by sharing that the legislation that was passed, and you'll hear about these bills in just a moment, was rooted in what we called the Task Force for Maternal Mental Health. It was formed through a resolution, so a piece, a, a bill, not a piece of legislation, but a bill that called for the formation of a task force with multiple stakeholders, various uh, state agencies, various clinicians represented, including representatives from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, hi, Emily. Emily sat on the task force, so I have to acknowledge you. Emily is a reproductive psychiatrist. Stand up, Emily, please. Stand up. Uh, Emily's been instrumental in sharing her knowledge in this space and helping to create this pathway for change. Diana Barnes was also uh, a consultant to the task force. Thank you, Diana, for your work. There were 16 appointed task force members after this resolution was passed. Uh, we worked with uh, two funders, one of them who is a sponsor of today's event, the California Healthcare Foundation and the other, whose room we're in right now, the California Endowment, in funding this critical work, bringing these stakeholders together to create this path for change. I wanted to share just a little bit about some of the output for, from this uh, work. I know some of you have heard us speak about this in the past, but know it can be a really helpful refresher. Um, and all of this is actually loaded in the app. The full report, the full task force report is in the app. And we encourage you, it, it looks daunting. It's 66 pages, but much of it are appendices. And it's actually not too difficult to get through. My friend, my pediatrician friend, all of a sudden I, I um, am embarrassed. You guys, help me. Carol! Carol, stand up. Jeez. Hi, Carol. Carol was on the task force as well, um, representing the uh, pediatric field. Thank you, Carol. So the work products that were actually created as a part of this task force initiative really focused on you know, what, what as clinicians in this, in this field um, doesn't exist that should exist that will help us all. And what the group couldn't decide on or couldn't agree on rather was whether or not providers needed to be trained in maternal mental health. And I know some folks are thinking, how can that be? But there are many uh, providers who felt like, we, we have the basics. We've got this down. Don't require us to take any training. What we could all decide on, though, was that it was critical that we needed to agree on core competencies for each provider type. So OBGYNs, for example, have core competencies. Uh, providers like lactation consultants, we have drafted core competencies for for them, for pediatricians, for psychiatrists, and for reproductive psychiatrists. What differentiates those that practice psychiatry from those that study it even further? The continuum of care was created and recognizes that there's four key parts of a mother's experience. That's uh, pregnancy, inpatient, the time of delivery, or any other inpatient. Um, stays the postpartum period, and I'm forgetting the other one. Someone will have to remind me in just a moment. Um, 
Also, we uh, asked our colleagues at Postpartum Support International if they would mind pulling together all of the research to talk about screening score cutoffs. So many of you know and researchers have shared um, work around uh, uh, research and, and screening for postpartum depression and prevalence, but there really has no been, not been one score cutoff that has been published over and over again as a positive. Should it be a 10 on the Edinburgh screening tool, for example, or should it be something else? So we asked for some clarity through our partner, Postpartum Support International, and they developed these uh, cutoffs and also timing recommendations for when screening should happen. Uh, should it be once during the perinatal period, once during pregnancy, once in the postpartum? And of course, Postpartum Support International, the advocates that they are, are really recommending very um, robust set of screening um, timeframes. And those recommendations are all on PSI's website and also uh, mentioned in the white paper as well. We also wanted to make sure that there was a menu of treatment options. And one of our funders, Stephanie Chalecki, was very clear that she felt like women always should be brought to the table and be uh, provided a menu and be involved in creating their treatment plan. We know that many young women in particular are not interested in taking pharmaceutical uh, uh, drugs for um, their depression even if, or anxiety, even if it's warranted, they are interested in trying other things first. Um, and this menu of treatment options provides all of the evidence-based uh, treatment and even preventive steps in this menu. Again, um, something that's in the full white paper that you all have access to. And then finally, the task force or the Blue Ribbon Commission, as we also call it, recognize that one of the struggles in our space in maternal mental health is that there are a lot of players but no clear direction around how each stakeholder group can play a role in identifying and addressing and mitigating maternal mental health disorders. So what uh, we included in an appendix was recommendations for um, various groups like lactation consultants, but also recommendations for their trade association. So uh, the hospital trade association here in California has recommendations and a pathway for change that the, the group agreed on. So do the, the state agencies, including the Department of Public Health, who does um, various things working with uh, the population in the state. Um, our Medicaid state agency, the Department of Healthcare Services is noted, and others. So really a detailed roadmap of who should be doing what and when that the group agreed upon. So really helpful work products. There were also five major um, barriers and calls to action. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of these. I wanna point out though that last statement at the very bottom of the deck says uh, that the task force really felt like we needed an aggressive goal. How are we gonna know whether or not we're effectuating change? And the task force called for a goal of screening, so providing women one of the, the evidence-based screening tools, the Edinburgh or the PHQ-9, for example, or the Beck inventory, uh, Dr. Beck, uh, and, and having women be screened um, at least once during pregnancy or the postpartum period, and 80% of women um, uh, need to be screened by the year 2020. And so what, what year is it right now? <laughs> this was very aggressive, and 100% by the year 2025 um, was the, the most aggressive goal, um, recognizing, of course, that 100% is hard to attain. But this is the backdrop, and, and the report was issued to the state legislature, and we had um, quite, quite a bit of interest from uh, legislative partners, including um, Brian Mainshine's office, who carried two bills, and um, another office. Uh, carried one more. So I'm going to um, quickly talk about these two bills and then we're going to get to talk uh, in more detail at lunch for those of you that want to go deeper on these um, pieces of legislation and particularly those of you that are affiliated with the hospital. We want to provide you with some resources and tools around how you might comply um, and we'll talk about that again in lunch. I'll, I'll mention the room in just a minute. So the two bills that were passed effective 1-1-2020 uh, and again, uh, the sausage making process around legislation is interesting because some of you might go, what? why were the dates set the way they were? And we really had no, um, 
that didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. So, so one one twenty twenty a, a whole year off. Um, yet we know hospitals. This bill is getting a lot of attention, and hospitals are calling and emailing quite frequently. This is AD thirty thirty two hospital maternal mental health, and this requires hospitals to train clinicians and educate women about maternal mental health disorders. Um, this includes both the training and the education, the range of disorders, um, also prevalence, so that people know that these are the most common complications of pregnancy, um, and also um, informing providers about uh, evidence-based treatment uh, in the training, and then patients about evidence-based treatment that may exist in their local community. So patients will be educated about these things and also be informed about what treatment programs exist in the community, if anything. I'm very excited about this bill because I suspect that many of the hospitals that will be working on this um, will realize, boy, we have no resources to refer moms to. Like, what do we put on that line? And we can be a part of effectuating change. The next bill is effective 7-1-2019, so this July. Um, the other component of this bill which I actually am um, excited about, the role that insurers might play in this space. Uh, the initial language in the legislation talked about case management programs and care coordination, um, recognizing that insurers have great expertise and ability to help in this manner and refer women into in-network um, care and help manage and follow these patients. The language that uh, we, we le were left with in the bill um, was not that specific. And it says that insurers shall develop maternal mental health programs. The idea is that they support in some way uh, women and providers in this screening process and uh, treatment uh, coordination process. So let's just stop and celebrate together for just a moment that le these laws are in place. And I just also need to recognize and, and, and acknowledge those of you in the room. I see um, a few of you who were at the state capitol many times. We know Ed and Millie shared their story in a powerful way. And we should put that testimony up. We'll put it in the app because it, it uh, left all of the legislators who were there to hear it. We were the last bill that night in tears, really, um, and so touched, and we know it really made a difference. It takes a village, this work, and we're so glad that it's now a priority issue in California. So if you were involved, can you please stand up? If you were involved in coming to Sacramento, if you sent any letters, Melanie Thomas was our reproductive psychiatrist, so thank you, Melissa. Well, we're gonna start, um, Nina. I think that uh, after hearing Dr. Beck speak that you probably have lots of ideas and can think about some of the stories that you've heard uh, in your reporting about mothers who have lost lives or have, have had near-death experiences. And would you just tell us a little bit about uh, your series to start and also what resonated with you, resonated with you? Um, thank you for having me. So our project um, was largely focused, at least what we published, on maternal mortality. So um, asking the question and trying to explore why it is that you, the U.S. has the highest rate of maternal deaths um, in the, uh, among affluent countries at a time when other countries have been um, managed to bring down their rates of maternal mortality. The U.S. has been rising. And... Um, uh, at least as significant for the purposes of, of our reporting and, and people here, the number of um, the amount of life-threatening complications, severe morbidity has actually also been going up hugely over the last 20 years. And so um, as we were exploring our uh, maternal deaths, um, we came across um, many women for whom um, uh, for whom mental health issues were uh, uh, sort of um, sometimes not the obvious cause of death, um, not an obvious factor, but um, absolutely were. Um, and then the, um, uh, I think particularly of um, a couple of women we wrote about um, 
one of whom was a young mother in, Tex in Florida who um, had suffered life-threatening um, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. So she had a, a heart condition at her third pregnancy. Um, she delivered the baby, everything. Um, uh, she was diagnosed. She was on Medicaid. And um, she had had substance use issues in the past and, and basically was, um, became very, very depressed because she thought she was going to lose, she knew she was going to lose her Medicaid after a couple of months. And she was concerned that she didn't have the resources, the emotional resources, the, the help with her family, um, the financial resources to take care of her family and to take care of herself with this um, difficult condition, um, highly treatable. Um, and so she basically locked herself in a room and didn't come out for a couple of months. And she suffered um, a heart failure and she died. And um, when you look at the, her cause of death, uh, the cause of death, of course, is PPCM. But the real cause of death was, a con was depression. And um, it was almost a form of suicide. We c obviously came across suicides in the course, really tragic stories. We came across stories of women who had suffered, who had survived um, traumatic births, life-threatening complications, but um, become so uh, uh, so traumatized by them that it really triggered spirals of anxiety and depression that ended um, in their deaths. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's the huge topic of substance use disorder and um, how that intersects with um, mental uh, with mental health. I mean, it is a mental health disorder, obviously, but it's just kind of the ways that we um, what happens to women when they when they go off um, they try to go off their um, substances when they're pregnant, and then they go and then they're left in the postpartum period with very little support. And um, so we we. That was a big factor, and then the other thing that we did was we we spoke with um, we we got stories from nearly five thousand women um, through a call out that we published with NPR, telling us their stories of nearly dying. And in those stories, I was really um, those many of those stories really um, resonated with what Dr. Beck was talking about. Um, traumatic births, inherently, these are women who nearly died, so they suffered life-threatening complications. What we heard over and over again was um, not just the sort of kinds of um, symptoms and, and reactions that Dr. Beth talked about. We also heard about the enormous depression and, and anxiety that go along with not being listened to and sort of the way that that alienates women and it alienates them from care, the way that being disrespected during pregnancy, um, and we heard this, I think this was particularly true for everybody, but I would say for a lot of our, the black mothers who, um, who uh, were in touch with us, really discourages women from going back and getting the kind of care that they need in the postpartum period. And so that sort of exacerbated um, the, the trauma uh, made it harder uh, for them to seek help. Um, what we also heard was fear. Um, a lot of women are really afraid of what might happen to them. They're not just depressed. They're not such as it's 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 a it's a real fear that this traumatic thing that happened to them um, during their pregnancy or their birth experience or their postpartum period. Um, could suddenly happen to them a six months later, a year later. I think there are certain complications that um, were particularly um, uh, likely to kind of where women were to carry that sort of fear, blood clots, um, uh, PPCM, um, hypertension. Um, so those were sort of the things that really resonated for me. Um, and also, but just how common it was, just how over and over and over again, people said, I'm afraid, I'm not listened to, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, my children are anxious, my husband is anxious. Um, the ways that it ripples out into finances and just in every way in people's lives. Really, help, really helpful, thank you. I, um, I want to make sure that folks know that Nina's reporting um, not only inspired other reporters to do similar work, USA Today also um, wrote a great piece on this issue around maternal, preventable, 
preventable maternal deaths in the U.S. Uh, rate being uh, through the roof and the highest of any developed country in the, in the world, um, but also helped to pass federal legislation that will create support for states to research and investigate the causes of death and create strategic plans in their state for preventing um, these, these tragic deaths and preventable deaths. So uh, shout out to you for, for your uh, work and influence there. And I also want to acknowledge we've got some, some folks um, watching through webcasts that were instrumental in getting that legislation passed, including partners um, from the Preeclampsia Foundation, and others that are part of a new um, Mama's Voices Coalition, which Kay Matthews is also a part of, and 2020 Mom has the pleasure of being a part of to help states bring mother's voices to the table and reviewing um, maternity care and how we can improve it together. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I am uh, gonna turn it, we're gonna come back to you, Nina, but I'm gonna turn it um, now over to uh, Dr. DeMarco. Um, would love for you to talk a little bit about your program. Um, I do also want to point out on your table, some of you have framed um, copies of this. Um, you can see that Cigna has developed um, a program with St. Joe's Hoke Health, and I would be remiss if I didn't um, mention that as uh, uh, Cigna being a sponsor, a really great product that's been developed, and Patty's going to talk a little bit about the program that she works for that's a part of that. Uh, provider network. So we're going to turn it over to you. Talk to us a little bit about why you knew there was an opportunity for maternal mental health. Who was the leadership? Why did it get started? Thanks so much, Joy. So to give you a little context first, um, you'll remember that nice compilation of studies in 2012 by Nancy Byatt that kind of like described, you know, provider level barriers and patient level barriers and system level barriers. So in every, and you actually included that in your white paper, um, and um, in every institution you're gonna have a unique set of operational challenges, right? So if you're, for example, in a federally funded VA, you might have a very high level of integration and just kind of like have your dream collaborative care model where you have primary care mental health integration you also might have some federal funds, but then you have other challenges like a centralized decision making, which I was just telling Dr. Dossett about, where you kind of have to navigate several layers of approval and you know, bureaucratic layers to get your program started. If you're in an academic center, you might have other good stuff, like you might have more manpower because you have uh, residence trainees that are tethered to a faculty member. Um, and you can see more patients. You might also have more funding if you do a lot of academic contributions and get some research grants. But then you have difficulties again with integration. HOGUE is actually <coughs> different. So it's a community, not for profit healthcare network that has two acute care hospitals. And combined, uh, the two hospitals have about 650 beds um, together. They deliver 6,800 babies per year. So if you do a little projection just based on the stats, so up to 20% of women will have clinically significant depression during pregnancy and the postpartum, without acknowledging any other mental health disorder, just depression, that's 1,300 women that are probably struggling in silence um, with this condition. Now the prenatal care for these women and their postnatal care in my setting occurs in the community via private practices and OBGYN large private practices. Some of them are affiliated with HOGUE, some of them aren't. And the postnatal care, and you know, like the baby care happens with pediatricians as well in the community. So we acknowledge back in, so in 2015, we came up with these ideas like, well, that's a lot of women and that's a lot of babies and we need to do something about it. So, but we need to screen, but if we screen, it's kind of like that book if you give a mouse a cookie. So if you screen, you have to give them a place to get assessment and treatment. And if you do that, you can't forget linkage because there's a lot of community resources that we can leverage on. And then if you do that, we kind of have to educate because it's kind of like, it's kind of like when breast cancer became common enough, serious enough, and treatable enough to screen for. There was this national campaign to get women to do self-breast exams and you know, for hospitals and OBGYNs to do annual breast exams. Same thing is happening with this wave with maternal mental health, so we've got to educate. If we don't do that, none of the other layers are going to work. So the first thing we did is like, we kind of sat together and scratched our heads and said, well, this is a lot to do uh, in a pretty big system. Uh, we wanted this roadmap of screening, assessment, treatment, linkage, education, and outreach, how we're going to tackle this, so we put together a task force. And at the time, we didn't have the white paper. We didn't have AB 3032. We didn't have the, um, even the statement from the U.S. Prevention Task Force hadn't come out yet, so we didn't, need, we didn't have leverage, so we needed data. 
So we surveyed all these hog affiliated obese and pediatricians and we realized that about 20% of them were screening somehow with a validated tool sometime in the perinatal period. So within the two, you know, within that year and nine months of the perinatal period, they were doing that. And uh, we face our efforts and uh, we, uh, with the survey results plus the statement from the US um, Prevention Task Force, we gather enough support to get a grant for a support line. And so we launched, we piloted a support line that was staffed by a wonderful Angela Mains here at LCSW and her job was to just help women and doctors navigate the very complex, very fragmented healthcare system to try to connect to somebody, whether it's a perinatal psychiatrist or a women's mental health friendly one, <laughs> uh, you know, community. Yeah. So all her job was to link, and you could be a doctor, you could be a nurse, you could be a, a patient, it doesn't matter where you live, and what kind of insurance you have, she would link them. And she also started her education and outreach activities. So we kind of came out to the HOG affiliated doctors and gave lectures, uh, you know, using the EPDS, use it on a schedule, what to do with a positive result. After about a year of that, we um, gather enough support and um, leverage, and then the white paper came out uh, to leverage on that too. Thank you. But that gives us a lot of, um, a lot of leverage to gather support for another grant, and then we launched a clinic, which is the assessment and treatment portion of that plan. Um, the clinic is uh, the closest level of integration that we can get is co-location. We're co-located with large OBGYN practices and pediatrician practices, and we're embedded within what's called the Center for Wellness, which has acupuncture, meditation, prenatal yoga, mindfulness, and a public health program. Isn't that cool? So it's not labeled like the Center for Postpartum Depression, but the Wellness Center where all sorts of services are offered. Well, congratulations on such um, incredibly hard work and for your leadership in developing the program. We'll come back to you. Uh, I would love uh, to turn it over, um, Gabrielle, to you to talk a little bit about the Park Nicolette system. How, how did you get started? Why did you know there was a problem? What was your leadership, commitment, those kinds of things? Yeah, so um, since I'm the outsider here, I'm going to give you a little context because no one knows what Park Nicolette is. Uh, I assume there's maybe some Minnesota person here. But um, so closer, closer, better, OK. Um, so uh, Park Nicollet Health Services has been around for a long time. Uh, it is about 1,000 plus uh, physicians on staff. Uh, if you look at my slides, I gave you a map of our clinic. So we have lots and lots of clinics. We have lots and lots of doctors. Um, uh, we have uh, one main hospital, two affiliated hospitals. So back in 2011, at the time, the chair of behavioral health uh, recognized that um, there was this gap for maternal mental health. It was 2011, we weren't really talking about it in the same way we are uh, now. So she gathered the stakeholders. So the stakeholders were um, her, the chair of pediatrics, the chair of family medicine, the chair of OBGYN, um, and got together and convinced them pretty quickly uh, that we were going to do universal screening for postpartum depression using the EPDS. Uh, we were very lucky in that uh, early on, those leaders in those um, primary care departments were on board. They got it. They got how we in behavioral health would be helping their patients get better. Um, and so over a series of um, uh, about a year, we rolled out different pilots. We first piloted um, the EPDS screening in OBGYN. Then we moved on uh, to pediatrics and family medicine. So, so as we say, since the winter of 2011, we have done universal screening for postpartum depression in our system. And again, in my slides, I give you the um, the, the schedule of when we screen. So uh, between uh, pediatrics and basically OB slash midwifery, if a woman does her prenatal care and keeps her child in our system for pediatric visits, she'll be screened nine, uh, excuse me, seven times, starting at the 24-week prenatal uh, through this baby's six-month uh, six well child visit. We also have, um, in our main hospital, we have a special care nursery, so not a NICU, but a special care nursery, and we screen moms once a week uh, for as long as their child is um, in the special care nursery. So uh, to the point of uh, screening is great, but all the recommendations also say you have to have competent people to refer to. Otherwise, that screening just sort of lays flat. So um, the other side of what we've done since 2011, we 
created them at the same time was the, what we call the Women's Reproductive Mental Health Program, which again, very large name, long. And when we were pitched, we had a different name, and then we were choosing a different, uh, we were like, this doesn't make sense anymore. And so we sort of did a survey of nationally what are other programs called, and it's very easy to add lots and lots of words, like and it's reproductive, wellness, and it's just, so we had, to, we had to stop somewhere. So that's where we stopped. Um, the, that is currently made up of nine therapists, both masters and doctoral level therapists, two psychiatrists, a social worker, and we have two social work interns. Um, I'm also super excited that in July we're going to get a third psychiatrist who used to be an OBGYN and went back and got her residency in psychiatry. So like when her CV came in through uh, that, we were all like, oh. I like literally salivated. I was like, please let her be good. Please. <laughs> uh, so she's like. That's a unicorn. Yes, I was literally about to say, <laughs> yeah, she, is, she is the unicorn, yeah. So uh, thanks to a shoulder injury, she can no longer practice OB anymore. So I guess we, we win on that. So, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so we do these screenings in um, primary care. Uh, we do the EPDS on paper. They're, the mom is room, the LPN nurse um, scores it, hands it to the, the physician. Uh, we've done a lot of training for physicians across um, those specialty departments around like how do you talk about this, what are the expectations for what they should be doing in the office visit. And something that we added into our program pretty quickly was realizing that those doctors were willing to do the screenings if they had behavioral health support. Uh, so one of the things that we created was this um, Masters of Social Work training program. So those are my two interns. So across our system, all the EPDSs that happen, um, every day they come to us usually by fax, and then my interns go through every single one, sort of rescore it to make sure there's, there's human error. And then everybody, we use a, a cut score of 10. Uh, we decided to take the most conservative route there because the EPDS, for those of you guys who know it, it's very easy to fake good on that. Um, and it's also very easy to be very anxious and score below a 12. And so that's why we used uh, 10. So then those interns, we reach out by a phone to moms. Um, we try to get a hold of her two times. If we don't get a hold of her on the phone, we have a letter that we send along with um, sort of what we call it the maternal wellness guide. It has some local um, resources, our information. We were pretty clear with the interns um, when we train them and, and the purpose of that when they call, they say, hey, uh, hi, I'm a, a care coordinator from Park Nicollet. So when they make that first phone call, it doesn't have mental health, it doesn't have behavioral health on it uh, with the idea of hopefully opening um, uh, the conversation. And our interns are always surprised because they think, oh my gosh, I must be intruding on this woman. I'm calling her, she's got a newborn. And usually the exact opposite happens. This woman has been at home with no human contact, no adult contact. <laughs> And uh, sometimes we have to tell them, no, you can't have a 45-minute phone call with everybody because we have other people to call. Um, and so then as part of that conversation, we do sort of a, uh, basically a biopsychosocial triage. Um, so that could then include getting her an appointment within our lactation consultants, uh, a community resource. They do a lot of resource brokering or uh, do a warm handoff to our behavioral health intake department. All those clinicians that I mentioned, um, so the, the nine therapists, the two psychiatrists, we have a special um, appointment type in our system. Our electronic medical record is EPIC. Many of you are familiar with that. Um, so those uh, clinicians all carry um, special OB intakes, meaning that only pregnant and postpartum or women who have dealt with um, a pregnancy loss or infertility um, challenges can go there. We have both regular and what we call also urgent. So we have urgent psychiatry and urgent therapy that is less than 10 days out. Um, and so uh, for context of that, last year, so in 2018, um, we screened women across our system over 19,000 times. Um, I know, right? That's a lot of faxes that come. <laughs> um, uh, that I, also in my slides I have some data. You can see pretty clearly our number always hovers at about 8%. Uh, so it's lower than that sort of 17 to 20 percent that you hear. Um, I've always attributed it to, again, the EPDS is really easy to fake good on, and we jokingly say, like, how many of them come through as zeros? And we'll always laugh, and I'll be like, on a, my best day, I'm like a seven, you know? Um, so we know that there are women that are just not in the place um, to report those symptoms in that time, which is why we screen so many times, thinking that sooner or later um, we'll capture her. So Thank that's you. my program. Great program.
Gabrielle's slides are in the app. You should take a look at those. We also have some more information on our website about the award-winning program. Uh, we're going to turn it back to Nina for just a moment. I, um, I, we didn't talk about this question, but what I want to hear from you, Nina, is we've, we've learned a lot about traumatic birth and that hospitals um, are a place where trauma can happen during delivery for a variety of reasons. The stories that you've covered around um, loss, women losing their lives, there seem to be a lot of preventable steps that hospitals could take. Um, and I would love to hear from you, what, you know, have you, do you have ideas? Like what would, would be the two or three things you would wanna see hospitals do to reduce birth trauma or, or death? And we didn't talk about this, so I hope I'm not throwing you a, a, a humdinger here. Um, no. Uh, that's a really good and really huge question. Um, I think that um, I think that one of the things that we discovered is that um, many hospitals, shocking to me actually, maybe the, one of the most shocking things is how many hospitals in this country, especially two years ago when we started um, doing the reporting, really didn't have protocols and systems in place to deal with obstetric emergencies. Um, we, uh, that is changing thanks to a bunch of programs. California, CMQCC has been really influential in showing what happens when you do put protocols and systems in place. You bring down deaths and, and um, significantly. Um, other states uh, through the AIM program are adopting uh, similar kinds of things as well. I have to say it's going super slowly. Um, and a lot of the rollout is just focused on hypertension and um, hemorrhage. And there are a lot of other causes of death um, that uh, there should be a lot more protocols in place. The idea that only in five or six years we're going to finally get around to a sepsis protocol or a, or a, a blood clot um, protocol is, um, to me, five, or two, five, five years too late, um, maybe 10 or 15, because they could have been doing this a while ago. So there's that um, uh, really kind of... Uh, um, putting those systems in place. The second thing I would say um, that was really has been remarkable is something that is a theme that has come up here a lot, and it is the extent to which in pretty much every way that we can think about hospitals prioritize, and, and providers, and just our whole system prioritizes the health and safety of babies over that of mothers. And it just you know percolates out in so many different ways, and to really sort of center mothers at, in the center of the childbirth, pregnancy, <laughs> postpartum experience seems pretty obvious, but is really really huge. And when you think about that, it means a lot of different things. It means listening to women, taking them seriously. It means focusing on them. Um, it means much better postpartum care. Um, as well as prenatal care, and so there's that. And then the third issue, you know, vitally important, is really trying to figure out how to deal with um, health disparities, racial disparities, and in, in you know, in, in um, outcomes for moms and for babies. And that gets to really profound changes that have to happen um, among providers and sort of his, you know, culturally and societally about the many kinds of factors that um, uh, kind of accumulate um, over the lifespan and really come to a head, I think, in the pregnancy and birth period, and especially, again, in the postpartum period for a lot of um, moms of color, especially black moms. And, um, you know, and I think that that's an incredibly profound and important thing that is um, really uh, vital to kind of um, because when we're talking, there's there's the, the the issues around race, obviously that affect um, specific communities and specific groups of women, um, but but it's also a, a broader issue that affects everybody in terms of the dis the respect and and that we care that we give for. Um, uh, for all women, um, and, and especially women of color. And so, yeah, those would be my three things. That's great, right? Kind Thank of big. You. I, I feel like that deserves a round of applause, yes. We have about seven minutes left, and I wish we had planned this 
panel for an hour because there's so much to talk about. But I would love to hear from each of you about um, anything that you want to touch on relative to your policies around preventing uh, um, birth trauma. Uh, anything that you want to share and or you can pick one if you'd like. Uh, tell us about sustaining these programs, funding, startup funding to develop these programs in hospital settings. We know many of you in the room um, want to do this kind of thing. And also, how do you sustain these uh, resources over time? So if you got a grant initially, as you talked about, um, what happens when the grant, grant run, runs dry? Excuse me. So we'll start with you. Um, Dr. So, so I'll try to make it as brief as I can. So uh, yes, so the system level barriers are, we're not exempt of that in, the, in Orange County or in California by any means. Um, and, the, and, they're, and they're very deep and I think it has to do with, yes, there is a shortage of mental health professionals, psychiatrists and therapists alike, especially ones that are focused in this particular population, but there's also a pseudo shortage. And I'll tell you what that means. Uh, traditionally, uh, reimbursement for mental health has not been good. So uh, there, you know, it's, it's, usually, it's usually low. The fair market value is not really fair. Uh, usually the, the, you know, delayed payments, um, denials, uh, that tends to drive mental health professionals into the free market and outside of the insurance industry, which then creates a lack of access. Uh, there's also sort of that phenomenon of the 15 minute visit, right? So we want the psychiatrist to operate at the top of the license, which essentially means only prescribe medications, uh, neglecting pretty much every Everything else that they've been trying to do for and that creates provider dissatisfaction that creates patient dissatisfaction they're not happy with seeing their psychiatrist just for 15 minutes if any uh, and it doesn't improve outcomes either um, there's also sort of the fragmentation so so unless we really um, kind of pay attention and try to recruit this mental health professionals back into the uh, payer mix back into the insurance industry you know that shortage will that pseudo shortage will continue to deepen um, in our system, we bill. We take every single panel out there. We have the most aggressive biller. We chase the denials, and we still get 30 cents on the dollar for mental health, no matter what we do. There is a range of non-billables, too, that are not recognized for. I have to do a lot of education. We have to do a lot of screening. We have to do a lot of linkage. We have to do a lot of outreach, because this is a wave. This is maternal mental health is increasingly recognized, but it's not thoroughly um, known yet. I, we can't bail for that. So is it sustainable based on just an insurance-based model? Right now it isn't. It's sustained because it happens so that the healthcare network recognizes the savings on the back end by having a healthier community, by preventing the risks of untreated illness, by preventing the preterm birth, the IUGRs, the preeclampsia, that you might be able to prevent by actually addressing mental health and having mental health have its rightful place in healthcare. So we ought to do something to recruit. Now, I'm pretty excited about this. You know, and you mentioned later, earlier in Cigna, uh, how they are kind of taking a stance on recognizing mental health uh, more and they're actually creating products around like unlimited telehealth visits for mental health. That opens a door, that really does open a door because interestingly, and I found this in Orange County and I'll finish this quickly, the insured mom, at least in my community, has the least access. So she's in short, she's got benefits, there's a carve out somewhere that says that there's a panel of psychiatrists, but she, she picks up the phone, goes through, down the list of the psychiatrists or the therapists in the panel, and the, all she hears is come back, you know, call me when you're not pregnant, go back to your OBGYN, stuck in that ping pong. So it's the insured mom, at least in my community, that has the least access. The uninsured mom, the unfunded mom, underfund, or underfunded mom, has some access, we can definitely do better in the region, but has some access to county funded programs. So we, we, we've, you know, looked at those challenges and, um, and we are sustained by the network and by philanthropy and by billing and it's a really creative way that we've had to come up with. Okay. Answer the question, thank you. Yeah, I can, I can speak to, um, billing and funding on our end. So in the, the state of Minnesota, there was a, a, um, a bill passed a few years ago that actually pediatricians can bill for the EPDS, um, which was also a good selling point when we went to the pediatricians and said, hey, do this other screening, right? They also are doing all sorts of developmental screenings. Here's this one more thing, and but yeah, you can bill for it. Uh, so that was, was good for them. Um, what, so 
if, if it wasn't clear before, so our program um, is owned by behavioral health. That's, we are the sort of central hub, right, that's going out to specialty care. And I think, um, I think that works really well. There are other programs um, where it's a little more diffuse or and behavioral health isn't the owner of it. And I think there's um, some challenges that come with that. As a result of it being owned by us, the budget becomes ours. And so uh, the history of this would be that um, uh, the EPDS is free. It costs some money to uh, print it. So the costs to that were to the departments. So that's pretty minimal. On our side, we did um, uh, receive an innovation grant when we added that care coordinator, when we added those interns. And really what that was, was we had to pay our LICSW um, for her lost productivity time. We work on a productivity model, right? So she had to do an hour of supervision every week plus like field all their questions and stuff. So that grant, um, at the time, and this was, it would have been 2013, um, uh, we could do, we did it for about $7,800 for the year, which is not a ton, and then as a result got uh, 20 hours of student labor, so that was good. Um, because uh, we were able to show effectiveness of it and um, improve uh, patient care, our department ended up ultimately rolling that in going forward. So our department has a budget for that social worker um, to pay for her lost productivity time. And, and that's ultimately the biggest cost of it is for, in our world to have, to have that, um, that supervision time. So our program runs very lean. Um, and then we bill um, behavioral health when the patients come in, psychiatry, therapy, um, et cetera. So it's, it's not incredibly daunting in that way for us. Great, and we should also share that something that makes your model unique is that there is, um, it's a, a, essentially a Kaiser model uh, where it's a staff model where behavioral health um, uh, clinicians are paid by Park Nicolette, right? Right, yeah, um, we are all, basically OB, we are all in one house, whether it, the um, all primary care, all specialty departments, and our main hospital, including behavioral health, are in one system. So a patient can go to their OBUGYN, um, get screened at 24 weeks, she becomes positive, let's, she, and she wants to go to behavioral health. She literally drives down the street to Park Nicollet Behavioral Health. Um, everything is in network, all of that is taken care of. Her medical record is in one spot, which is great. Um, so yeah, so the fact that we are kind of all in-house under one makes for better patient care and easier, um, you know, the cost and funding things too, so. Great, good, thank you. Um, 2020 Mom is launching um, a learning network and one of our key uh, learning circles will be for hospitals. So we are very interested in having these two um, share all that they have learned in a deeper way in that learning network that we hope will launch this summer. So. Thank you both. Um, we're gonna leave, uh, leave it with Nina um, to share any last comments that you want to um, hit on, Nina, and also anything that you want to address relative to the Medicaid population and the stories that you're gonna start to research soon. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of the reporting that we did, we, we did not focus on income as an issue. I think that we were intentionally, didn't focus on income because it kind of, it's a huge topic. Um, and also because we didn't wanna uh, have people react to our initial stories um, by saying, well, that's, that's because they're poor. Um, and that's because they have bad insurance and or they are uninsured. Um, we really wanted to kind of look at the larger system um, and how it worked for everybody. Um, but I am starting reporting and looking at low, trying to focus on low, lower, low and lower income women um, in the uh, in the country and 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 the and the care that they that we give them. I should say not the, uh, through. Um, Medicaid and CHIP and whatever states call their versions of Medicaid. Um, uh, and as this, you know, Medicaid pays for um, half the, almost half the births in this country. Um, many, many um, uh, low-income women, obviously, but middle-income women in a lot of states. And just trying to really understand, and it's, it's um, you know, the, the kinds of problems we heard were very uh, prevalent across income, across education, um, across jobs, and that was why we focused on them. But I think that they're looking at sort of specific um, challenges that lower income and uh, middle income women, working class women face um, in, in, ac in, in accessing care that is um, uh, 
high quality and on time and respectful and and also gives them the uh, prenatal care that they need, but really the postpartum care that they need. One of the things that's happening around, that's starting to happen around the country that I think is really interesting is that there's um, gonna be a push you're gonna see in states this year um, trying to change their um, Medicaid laws to extend them to 300, to extend postpartum coverage to 365 days. That is something that, um, is going to really uh, start to roll out. It's a conversation that people um, are really going to have in earnest, and that's kind of exciting, I think. So that's something to watch. Thank that's you. That's great. Um, I have to say that California is uh, introducing the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Our partners here in California have introduced a bill to extend Medicaid or Medi-Cal coverage, as we call it here, um, for maternal mental health specifically through 12-month period so that they can actually treat and screen these mothers. So, yeah, and I, I want to say that I think it's interesting that, that is the, that's, the, that's the lever where a lot of this is going to happen. I think that um, uh, in states uh, that have been resistant to Medicaid expansion and to uh, higher levels of services for women, lower-income women, um, uh, they, those states also are suffering um, huge opioid problems at the moment and you know broader mental health problems and I think they're realizing that um, postpartum care is really important and so that is going to be I think the the crack in the door that maybe opens up coverage for um, all postpartum women but it's starting with mental health and um, it's, it already has in Missouri by the way so last year Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, um, panel. Uh, we have a gift for you as well. Uh, also, um, Karen Kleiman, uh, a, a well-known um, clinician in this space, Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts, her new book. It's not out yet. Uh, you each get one of those. And then, Nina, we also wanted to share um, another book with you by another author who you used to work with, Kate Rope, um, who is a great champion in maternal mental health. So I'm here to introduce a friend of 2020 mom and a warrior, and, and her name is Kay Matthews. Um, she's gonna tell her about her work in Texas and share her story. Hi everybody, I am Kay Matthews, and I'm the founder of the Shades of Blue Project based out of Houston, Texas. But before I was the founder of any organization, I was just plain old extraordinary K. <laughs> but just as life does sometimes, my whole world changed May 29th, 2013. And in a moment, as I knew it, it would never be the same. She was to be my first child and excited was an understatement. This was not how this was supposed to end. I forever wanted a daughter of my own. I imagined and prepared so much for her birth the weeks leading up to this day. In my head, she was a perfect little princess and she would look just like me, a mini K. I prayed and I prepared for her daily. But just like that, it became a moment in time I would never forget. On that morning, a horrible pain awakened me, along with a lot of panic and fear, because I had no idea what was going on. Calling 911 was the scariest thing because I had no idea what was next. Paramedics talking to me through the short ride to the hospital and lots of scary thoughts like, what's wrong with the baby, or running through my head, and then I remember this darkness that crept in from nowhere. And the next time I would hear anybody voice, it would be the ICU nurse telling me not to move, not to panic. And at that moment, I realized the morning of May 29th, I had delivered my baby girl stillborn. There was so much going on in my birth experience from the delivery to the postpartum period. I remember so vividly how I lost how lost I felt, 
when I left the hospital after a two week stay in the ICU. I remember the long ride home. I remember not going, wanting to go back to a home in which I should have been raising a daughter, but instead I would be planning a funeral. But most of all, I remember the way I felt when I was looking for resources to help me with my mental pain and I couldn't find any. My first thought was to look in my hospital bag because there must be something in there, right? No, just clothes and discharge papers. I often thought to myself, what a way to treat a woman who's lost a child. I've always thought about the hospital as this place before giving birth to my daughter that helps you and gives you a million pamphlets, even if you need them or not. But in my case, and in others, the system failed. I remember not wanting to go back to work. I remember uh, that feeling of having to explain or to fake how I felt so that others would not feel uncomfortable. The world tells you to just push through, no baby, no problem, wrong. But why, I would ask myself, yet I continue to operate how others thought I should. But in my private time, I searched for help because I knew something just wasn't right. Fast forward to nearly eight months later, a visit to my general practitioner would be my saving grace. In a conversation during my visit, I mentioned to him how I was feeling mentally and that I thought I was experiencing postpartum depression. And after telling him how I felt, he agreed. And he was the only one who assisted me in finding group therapy. And although it was a start, it was not all that was needed, but the healing process would begin. I am thankful, and I'm gonna say this again, I am thankful that I am this strong-willed person and that I fought my way to this recovery state of mind. But not everyone is me. I stand here today not pointing fingers, but asking that in all ways we start to really work together. The change I want to see happen is respect for every woman in their birth story, no matter the outcome. I believe that that starts in the hospital system and continues down the line. As caregivers and as employers, you have to do your duty, and so do we as community activist, advocates. But together, we can help people we serve and operate day-to-day -day tasks with by working together to completely meet everyone's needs. In closing, I acknowledge that today I wear pink because I normally wear blue. Today I wear pink for Troya Simone Williams. She is my daughter. I wear pink not in memory of, but because she continues to matter every time I share my story. She was born to be a legend, and although she is not Earthside, she is still creating a legacy through me. And I will continue to not just be her mommy, I will continue to make her life matter in death and make change happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm enjoying the uh, image of writing wildly. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you so much for uh, in inviting me to speak, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, humbled to be among um, uh, this group of, of um, advocates uh, and activists. Uh, louder? Louder. Sorry. Um, you're doing incredible work, and, and uh, I'm thrilled to be joining you today. So uh, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, data that Ovia has collected on um, postpartum depression uh, through our apps uh, and how it compares to the commonly understood incidence or prevalence of this condition uh, in the United States based on other published sources, and then talk a little bit about the cost and the impact of this disease uh, for um, individuals and particularly for employers. Uh, Ovia Health, if you're, if you're not familiar with us, is a, a digital um, solution for, um, uh, for women and families. Uh, we are on the phones of about 40% of American pregnant women 
Um, we reach two million monthly active users, and we have a uh, clinical program that is made available to uh, self-insured employers and to health plans, uh, and we work with them to improve the outcomes um, for their employees or, or health plan members who are trying to conceive, who are pregnant, or who are new parents. Uh, and so obviously, um, depression during um, or after this time uh, has a significant impact on um, individual well-being, on family well-being, uh, on um, clinical outcome, cost, and hence on the employer. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here to talk about that today. So <clears throat> I'm going to turn around because I need a different set of glasses depending on the distance I'm looking at. So the, I think that most of us would, would say that the, the, the sort of the, the go-to source for the prevalence of postpartum depression in the United States is the Centers for Disease Control uh, study, which puts it at about 11 percent. Um, that study is based on um, two questions that are part of the PRAM survey, uh, and the questions are up here on, on, the, on the slide. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a, a, a sort of a national survey that is deployed um, state by state. It's slightly different depending on the state you're in, and the questions are slightly different by state, but, but these questions related to depression, um, which I think are sometimes known as the PHQ-2, uh, were included in 27 state samples um, over in, in several different years, and they were used to create this um, prevalence rate. Uh, of 11 percent. The survey is mailed uh, to the individual's home. Um, it's completed on paper and mailed back, and then there's a whole sort of follow-up process involving um, telephone sort of prompting uh, for those who don't return it. And um, it, it is, on average, returned four months after delivery, uh, although it could be any, any place between soon after delivery and about a year later. Uh, so you can sort of see where the sample comes from and how it's collected. But that's where the 11 percent figure comes from. Um, in my opinion, and just to be clear, um, I am not a mental health professional. I am an obstetrician. Um, and and I, I often sort of think one of the, the shortcomings of, of the um, sort of healthcare system for postpartum depression is that, that people like me um, made a conscious decision not to go into psychiatry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're not the best place to start, but in any event, r related to, to this particular survey, the, um, there are several problems. First of all, these two questions have a sensitivity of 58 percent. What that means is, is that for, for women who get a clinical diagnosis of depression, um, if, you give, if you ask them to answer these two questions, um, only 58 percent of them will answer in a way that makes the screen positive, which means that 42 percent were missing. That is, they have depression, but they don't come up positive on this screen. So right there you have a significant underdiagnosis in terms of this prevalence survey. Uh, then there are all the other problems, like when does postpartum depression or when does peripartum mental health issues, when does it spike? So does anybody, what, what do people here think? When does it spike? Anybody? Six weeks. Six weeks postpartum? Eight weeks postpartum? It's interesting. There aren't great data on this. There's some data. In the OVIA data set would show that it um, spikes at three months postpartum. Um, that's just our data set. Um, so this, the, the time frame for the survey also presents uh, uh, limitations. Um, so anyway, um, so uh, OVIA uh, deploys the uh, Edinburgh in our pregnancy app and in our postpartum app. Um, there are opportunities to take it three times in pregnancy, uh, twice postpartum. We now deploy the PHQ-9 in our fertility app, uh, and based on um, the half million or so uh, screeners that we had completed uh, at the end, as of the end of 2018, um, we were looking at an incidence rate uh, of um, 25% uh, for a score of 10 plus. And 
for a score of um, 13 plus. It was 21% uh, in pregnancy and 19% in the postpartum period. Uh, you'll also see that there's a very significant uh, prevalence of um, women endorsing um, thoughts of self-harm. So um, why is that? Why is it that uh, our data uh, suggests that the prevalence of this condition is so much higher than not only the CDC data, but also um, many of the sort of well-done um, incidence and prevalence studies uh, uh, that are out there? Um, it's an interesting question, and I, I, I surely don't have an answer for you. I think, I think it's because um, an app, whether it's Ovia or anybody else's, is safe. It's confidential. Um, you don't have to explain it to someone. You don't have to explain that you really don't feel good at a time when everyone's telling you you should. So I think that stigma has an awful lot to do with it. Um, but I think this is an area that, that is, is um, uh, it, that, that deserves more attention and I think is almost sort of a challenge to all of us to figure out how to eliminate that stigma or at least reduce it. Figure out how to do a better job of diagnosing uh, women that are suffering um, and providing them with the resources that they need uh, to feel supported and to be um, successful at home uh, and um, from a workplace perspective successful at work. Um, so I think that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge, and that's how at Ovia we sort of see these data. Is it's, it's a challenge to use the services that we provide to the um, millions of women who use our, our free app and, and uh, the employees of uh, our clients and, and members of our clients that um, uh, use our more robust clinical version of the app to, to sort of help them to uh, get access to the resources that they need. Uh, so the, the OVIA population essentially mirrors the nation, um, except that we, uh, we don't, we're not in Spanish, we're only in English, and so uh, we, have a under, we, we are underrepresented among um, those women where English is not their primary language. Um, so I don't know what the average age is, but whatever the average parenting age, average age of, of delivery in the United States, it's the same on OVIA. Uh, about 45% of our free users uh, receive their health insurance, health coverage through a uh, Medicaid program, which is our sort of proxy for SES. So we're, we're really fairly representative. I was just wondering about it in the context of digital natives, right? Is, it, is that part of the, the population? So the, que the question relates to, to who's comfortable on an iPhone. Um, and the answer is that, that uh, the um, American population of childbearing age um, is 100% comfortable on an iPhone. <laughs> and, and, you know, 95% of them have a smartphone. So uh, it, it's a, in the sort of hierarchy of important economic needs, a smartphone is one of them for this population. So the question is, I think we have a higher rate among the fertility population what, I don't know if you know what amount of, like, either 2 million active users want, what percent of those go from the fertility to the pregnancy to the, you know, postpartum, so is the attributable risk potentially higher because it's start with fertility issues? So the question is, is this, um, is a slightly wonky science question about uh, the um, uh, predisposition to be at risk given that they're starting at high risk for um, depressive symptoms in a trying to conceive population. Um, and that we hadn't really thought about that, but you're probably right. Uh, the, um, the, the population, we've got about 800,000 monthly active users of our fertility app. Um, Two thirds are trying to conceive many of them trying to conceive for a while, uh, and then um, almost everyone who succeeds does convert over to pregnancy. Um, so that it's possible that there's a slight bias, um, although I sort of wonder whether the depressive symptoms in the fertility app relate to difficulty conceiving, and that that's sort of washed out to some extent when they're successful. I, again, this is all speculation. And it could be the other way, the fact that they're depressed could be contributing to their there is years of research here, I can tell. Um, I, I'm going to, in the interest of time, move on, but I'm delighted to chat later.
uh, with anyone who's, who's interested. And, and we do a lot of research, by the way. We, we partner with about a dozen different academic institutions, um, all of the famous ones in Boston and, and all of the famous ones uh, in, in other states as well. <laughs> uh, so so uh, um, uh, in terms of cost, um, you know, uh, this condition is tricky when it comes to cost uh, for this reason. Um, first of all, you have women who are um, at risk but don't likely carry a diagnosis, yet that, that risk categorization comes with uh, some of the sort of associated costs that a diagnosis does too, and I'll get into that in a second. Then you have those who, who um, obtain a diagnosis. So, uh, you know, as you know, the, the Edinburgh, the PHQ-9 are not diagnostic tools, they're screening tools. And so, so, so ideally someone moves on from there uh, to the uh, attention of someone who um, has appropriate clinical skills, makes a diagnosis, and then gets them access to treatment. So treatment costs money, and there are um, all of the associated medical costs that are more likely to be incurred, um, both for the, the patient and also for her child, uh, in those who get a diagnosis of depression. Um, and then there are the work consequences in terms of productivity uh, and absenteeism related to a diagnosis. But the, the real issue with this condition is that there's a whole group that would meet clinical criteria for a diagnosis but never get diagnosed, right? We just miss them. That's sort of the point. And so these women are um, suffering without treatment. So they're not getting treatment, so it doesn't cost money, but they are incurring all of the associated costs, the increased risk of um, newborn emergency department visits, the increased risk of newborn hospital admissions, um, the uh, uh, um, increased risk of additional pediatric visits. Uh, all of these events cost money, uh, and yet it's hard to attribute them because you don't have a diagnosis in the first place. So when um, we search the literature, and, and I will admit that the literature is um, is not robust in this domain. Um, we put the cost uh, for a, a, um, an individual at $23,000, um, 710 per um, case, per, and, th and that in includes diagnosed and what we assume to be uh, um, um, d d cases that are not diagnosed. So whether that is borne by the individual, whether it's borne by her um, employer, uh, or her partner's employer, uh, or their health plan, um, it's a little bit of all of it, but this is a, a very significant, this is a very significant economic impact on uh, the workforce uh, in America. Um, and so, um, so what do we do about it? Um, the cost, that doesn't include uh, cost of care for, for effects on a, on a child, in right. the child. It does include that. Does. So in terms of the increased costs that are accrued by a child due to, because they're at risk due to their, their mom's um, diagnosis, that is included in that 23000 That's right. Yeah, the cost of the individual care, which is extrapolated from um, MDD, not PPD, is about $8,300 per case. Yes? So this would be this would be a case based cost, not on a per year basis. Right. Yeah. Total so cost. I'm, I'm saying it's probably much much higher. It's very for possible. long term emotional well being of children from what and, happens you know, to moms. And I think that you raise a really important point, which is that I'm talking about dollars and cents, and that has nothing to do with emotional suffering. Um, so, you know, what can we do about it? Like I said, I think it begins with the people in this room. It's a matter of um, um, identifying women where they are. Um, I'm being told to stop. Uh, help them to access the resources. And, and here's the real thing is, is let's figure out how we can um, reduce the stigma. Because I think that that is maybe the most important barrier to diagnosis of this very important condition. 
Uh, and as um, employers, um, I think that we can do a lot to reduce stigma in terms of the way we communicate, in terms of the way we communicate benefits and provide resources, uh, and then just making sure that that referral is um, seamless and that there are multiple uh, destinations that women who are suffering can go. Um, so I think it, it requires all of us uh, and our, our colleagues in the benefits office, our colleagues in the health plan uh, offices uh, to work together to address this um, topic, but I think we can do it. Hi everyone, it is great to be here. Thank you, Apple. I, um, I feel like a, the best, the luckiest special guest because I, in a minute, get to introduce the panel of experts. So I just get to say hello to all of you. Um, but thank you, Apple. Yes, so I um, do, I work at the Pacific Business Group on Health, which is a nonprofit coalition of employers and public agencies uh, with the goal of increasing quality and value in the health system. So we have dozens of different uh, projects and programs designed to uh, support our employer members. And um, I, in particular, I specifically lead our Transform Maternity Care program. And this was started back in 2012. And essentially, our employer members were saying, we're seeing these really high costs in maternity care with these mediocre results, things like unnecessary interventions, um, like C-sections on the rise, and uh, their employees not really being satisfied with their care. So uh, PBGH, at the uh, request of our board and our members, began this program. And I'm excited to continue to focus our efforts on things like reducing interventions, and uh, specifically over the next year plus, we'll be focusing on increasing access to midwives and basically allowing our our, all of our women to have um, access to choice and care team uh, and then eventually hopefully choice and care location. So because what we're hearing from moms is they want they want more choice, less intervention and a more personal birth experience. And we're so grateful for partners like California Healthcare Foundation and their listening to mothers survey that really came out with this strong demand and the fact that the system is not meeting this demand yet. So uh, PBGH, and I'm very excited that my uh, uh, newly acquired role is to get to lead, lead the charge and um, really elevate and promote the value and benefit of um, this interdisciplinary care team. Because um, we're really focused on um, not only giving women choice, but also allowing them to have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with providers. And I think that in, you know, in the spirit of everything that we've been talking about today with regard to maternal mental health, that's such a huge um, inroad to create with mom to be able to have that personal experience with your provider, to be able to detect signs early, um, and to really just, like I said, have a, a personal entire birth experience all the way from pregnancy, the delivery, and postpartum, and then hopefully a healthy, happy baby. So um, I so appreciate being able to be here, and thank you to 2020 Moms uh, for allowing us to be a partner. This organization is truly leading the charge to close gaps in maternal mental health. So with that, I um, am excited to introduce the next panel, and maybe um, folks can just come up to the stage as they as they come. Okay. Um, all right, great. So I'll start by introducing our moderator. Carol Mendoza is, uh, oh, sorry, I guess you can hear me better now. Uh, Carol Mendoza is a uh, human resources executive at IBM, uh, leading the global health and wellness team. She has held employee benefit leadership positions in everything from high tech, biotech, oil and gas industries, and um, has been a healthcare benefits consultant as well. Um, and she received her MBA from down the road at, at UCLA. <laughs> so thank you, Carol. And next, I'd like to welcome up Becky Bailey. She is the Senior Director of Global Benefits and Wellness at eBay. And we're so grateful to have Becky here. She is, has over three decades of experience in employee benefits, 
working um, as well across a range of industries from tech to financial services to entertainment. And she is a true expert in evolving culture and employee benefit design. Thank you, Becky. And next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stuart Lustig. Uh, Stuart is the National Medical Executive for Behavioral Health at Cigna. And as a board certified child psychiatrist, he has led an effort to disseminate Cigna's health services research through peer reviewed journals and conferences like this. Previously at UCSF, uh, Stuart was the director of child and adolescent residency training and uh, had received his medical training from Rush Medical College and Stanford and Harvard hospitals. Thank you. And next, I'd like to welcome Christine Morton. Where's Christine? Oh, great, thank you. Um, Christine is coming to us from the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative at Stanford University. She's a medical sociologist and conducts research on maternal morbidity, mortality and morbidity, translating these findings into um, these wonderful toolkits that a lot of us are very familiar with. So thank you, Christine, for being here. And, and um, she has a, a book uh, called Birth Ambassadors, which documents the history and experience of doulas in the United States. It's on the required reading list for Dona International. And she and her husband have two wonderful children, which were born safe and healthy thanks to great teamwork. Thank you, Christine. And next, I'd like to welcome Melissa Rial. She is the director of uh, US Benefits for Qualcomm. She administers the health, welfare, and retirement plans for over 10,000 employees. And since joining Qualcomm has been instrumental to the successful launch of the ACO in, or the Accountable Care Organization in San Diego. She's coming to us with 20 plus years of HR experience with a focus on creating total rewards programs that link directly back to the business's strategic goals. Thanks, Melissa. And in the interest of time, and since Apple already introduced him, Dr. Adam Wolfberg, we'd like to welcome you back to the stage. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. It's better. I think now that we've been through all the introductions, we have about five minutes left for the panel. So. <laughs> Hold your questions. Um, I'm so delighted that we're spending time talking about the employer's role in maternal mental health. Um, I attended the conference last year and there were only um, a couple of employers here and I'm so thrilled that there are, are more here that are going, helping to discuss this issue. Um, as it, you may wonder, why do we care about employers and why, why do employers have a role? And um, you, you may know, you may not, that uh, about half of the, the U.S. population is actually covered by employer-sponsored health plans. Uh, and this is a little old data, but um, in 2015, employers spent almost $700 billion on health care in the United States, and that's roughly equivalent to what Medicare spends. Um, so we have a, a huge role in health care in general in the U.S. And because maternal mental health does um, impact the, the family so significantly, I think um, the answers may start here uh, with uh, the folks on this panel. Uh, I also think that it's important to the three of us um, employers on the panel are all from technology companies and in the war for talent when it's difficult to, um, to get uh, new hires in the door, right? A, a lot of employers are focusing on women's health issues, so I think this is another women's health issue that we should add to the stack. Um, before I, I start asking questions of the panel, I wanted to talk a little bit about something we heard earlier, and that's the, um, the difficulty that insured moms have in getting access to care. Um, it, it, I was pleased to hear um, others talk about it today, and so if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll share my own story. Um, so I now have 25 years in benefits, but when, um, when I found out I was pregnant with my, my son, um, I had been working in benefits for a little over 15 years, and um, I, I figured I, I had this 
I had this covered, right? I knew how to, how to navigate the system. Everything was going to be great. Um, I was going to be 40 when I delivered my son, so um, I wanted to go to an academic hospital, see all the see all the right doctors, and go to the expert in the field. Um, and I was so pleased as I was going through uh, my pregnancy that this hospital actually reached out and did a screening and said, you know. I knew what they were asking, and I was so so excited that they were concerned about um, postpartum depression and, and maternal mental health. And when I went through the screening, I learned that I was I was doing fine, great. But they said they would follow up with me. Thank you, thank you. Um, they would follow up with me um, after birth. So mo moving along, um, my little guy was a little bit late. Um, we had. Uh, an emergency C-section because um, I had preeclampsia and I wasn't delivering properly. Um, and this was in the middle of a, um, a blackout in San Diego. I don't know if you remember, seven and a half years ago? Yeah. Um, I drove to the hospital in the middle of the blackout, so that was fun. Um, but I, I started struggling um, when we returned home. I wasn't bonding well uh, with Liam. He wasn't breastfeeding, uh, or we weren't bonding that way either. Um, he. I, he was colicky, and I would sit up in the middle of the night, you know, every hour on the hour, because I was the only one who could feed him. And I, while he was feeding, I was crying. And I tried to reach out, and you know, these people who were supposed to call me after I gave birth never called. I tried to call the number they gave me. I left messages, and nobody called me back. Um, I called the health plan, not Cigna, by the way. Um, uh, of and, course not. <laughs> um, and. Um, couldn't get any direction, and there were times in the first six weeks of um, after my son's birth that I had suicidal thoughts. That I um, I thought about harming him. You know what would happen if I was driving the car and it just crashed into something. I say this because an insured mom, someone who should know how to navigate the system, and I was I, I couldn't find help. Um, so finally, after about six weeks. Somebody called me back, um, and you know, I'm here. Liam's doing great. I'm doing fine, um, but it, but it's a, a challenge for for all kinds of different populations. So, I think that we as employers can be a good partner um, in helping to break down these barriers and help to bridge the gaps with uh, in the maternal mental health. And I'm now going to ask the panel about some of their experiences and some of the things that they've done in their own organizations. Uh, so first, actually, I'd like to go back to Adam for a minute, if you don't mind, um, and have you go into a little bit more detail on the cost of, uh, of untreated postpartum depression. And, and you mentioned a figure that was pretty staggering of $24,000. And some of that is medical claims. But could you talk a little bit about uh, productivity and, and the losses there? Because I think that's included in your figure. It is. Does, is this working? It is, right? Great. Closer? OK. I'm having trouble with the mics today. Uh, so you're, you're right, the, the 23,000 uh, <clears throat> 23, includes productivity. And so thinking about it from the medical side, um, there's about $8,300 of, we think, of um, care related to the, the individual herself. Uh, and then um, I don't remember the exact um, numbers, but, but there's an increased risk of um, ER visits, admissions, um, additional uh, ambulatory visits for both the individual and her child, um, which contribute significantly to um, increased medical expenses themselves. Then in terms of productivity, um, the numbers get um, really pretty sketchy. Uh, but um, if you think about the cost to replace someone uh, at approximately 25% of a salary, uh, and you figure that the um, uh, a job attrition um, of any um, the job attrition for women after they deliver in general uh, is about 30 uh, percent and some significant um, percentage of that relates to uh, unanticipated departure from the workforce that was was not the plan and is likely related to this condition um, we then extrapolated some piece of that 30 percent uh, attrition rate um, times the 25 percent of a salary uh, to give the remainder related to productivity. I think that what we don't capture very well at all is um, diminished productivity for those who are back at work but aren't really there. Uh, and I just haven't seen good data uh, on how you 
um, how you calculate the cost of someone who's in the seat but isn't performing at the level you expect them to. And I'll turn it, I'll actually ask Melissa or Becky if you can think of ways that uh, employers capture that data on uh, how present someone is um, when they return to work. I'd say that's something we've struggled with too to, to capture, but um, you know, re return to work um, processes and support is one of the things that, that we're really starting to focus more on uh, to try and uh, reduce that productivity impact. So I think that's something that employers can do is really start to look at how they can support moms as they return to work um, so that they can ramp back up to full productivity. Well, and while we're there with you, Melissa, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you do at Qualcomm, both around maternity care and um, behavioral health in general. Absolutely. Um, so we've been fortunate in that we've been able to develop a direct partnership with a local provider system. And so through that relationship, um, we've been working with them to improve the maternity care that our, uh, our mothers receive, um, working on reducing C-section rates. Uh, we've started to talk to them about increasing um, the use of midwives in the birth process. Um, we've also improved our maternity leave. So in addition to providing the six to 12 weeks of maternity disability leave, we also provide another 12 weeks at 100% pay for bonding. Um, and they can <laughs> Thank you. Is that for moms and dads? Yes, it is, moms and dads. Um, and then in terms of return to week, <laughs> or return to work, <laughs> um, we support moms that are uh, breastfeeding. So we, of course, have lactation rooms because it's required, but we provide online scheduling as well to make that easy for moms and really try and support them through that process. Uh, we have a couple of employee groups that one is for nursing mothers and the other is just for working moms in general. So they provide great support. Um, we also have backup child care that's subsidized by the organization. Um, and we even offer some parenting um, series where moms and dads can come and, and learn about how to um, be better parents and, and have more joy in the parenting process. Uh, and then in terms of mental health, we, about a year ago, began covering out-of-network mental health providers just like in-network providers. So we really wanted to make sure that um, everyone had as much access as possible and, and access to quality providers as well. Um, we also have an on-site uh, representative from our employee assistance program, so people can schedule on-site appointments with that individual. And then we're working with that local um, provider system that I mentioned to improve the screening process as well. So, Becky, if you don't mind following up on that. And, yeah. yeah, no, tough act to follow, but I think you can talk too about um, your EAP. Yeah, and then I'll just add, uh, as Melissa said, and I think that it's true of all of the employers, particularly in Silicon Valley uh, arena, uh, we have all expanded our maternity uh, parental programs. Uh, ours is the same. You have the disability portion, and then you fall into parental leave uh, for the birth parent and the non-birth parent. So it's really important for us to be as inclusive as possible and families look different in all sizes, shapes, colors, and styles. And so we wanna make sure um, that we are providing that level of coverage. Um, it is important too that um, mental health, not just in the maternity space as uh, we've talked somewhat today, uh, we did partner with a startup, of course, uh, in the Valley uh, to help us on mental health um, and they actually curated their own network. Uh, we had a lot of challenges as other employers did, uh, finding therapists, uh, the time from when someone needed care, um, the longer it goes, as all of you know, and especially the medical uh, teams, uh, it's harder to actually get someone to be able to have good outcomes. So uh, the team we partnered with, on average, 95% of our employees can get access to care within 24 hours. And if it's a critical uh, care case, it's usually within four hours. Um, and a lot of this is also through app-based, um, and it is just for the U.S. right now. I think we're all looking for ways how we expand some of this uh, outside of the U.S. We have some of the same types of concerns with employee populations. As we do want more of um, our parents to return to work, 
um, after they have children. Uh, we do provide support through a parenting program that we've developed um, last year. Uh, and for those of you that have been involved with um, maternity management, just that word when the insurance carrier calls or the program calls, very few people have an uptake on it. Uh, we've had the program in place um, for about nine months and we've got 350 enrollments globally. And what they do is they help from the moment that you're in the first trimester all the way through the first year of life. So as we talk about different programs, like you know, if the mother's concerned about you know, how am I gonna deliver as Carol was, they help come up with a birth plan. And in fact, they encourage every mother to have a birth plan. Uh, because most of us that have given birth, you don't know exactly what's gonna happen until it happens. Um, so they go through that. They actually provide support for nutrition. They provide support for um, uh, exercise, health coaching, lactation, and you can elect to have this at your home. And they have a large network of doulas and midwives that also support uh, the program. Um, so we kind of look at a way through the continuum as women and parents are important to us, um, not only as our customers, but also in our workforce, we look for ways to make the experience as good as possible. Thank you, and Cynthia, for both of them, don't you want to work in Silicon Valley, right? All the benefits are like that. Free food, too. Um, you mentioned doulas, so I now I'm going to ask Dr. Morton a question. Um, in your book, Birth Ambassadors, you suggested that all women should have an, a doula. Can you tell us why? Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, I think that um, all birthing families need that kind of support, that you don't know what's going to happen um, in the setting itself. Um, a lot of times the clinical care providers are not given the time to adequately explain what's going on to folks, especially if there's an urgent or emergent situation. Um, and I, I think now in healthcare, pretty much anybody who's in the hospital needs to have a patient advocate with them at all times. And so doulas were this innovative approach to bringing basically childbirth education right to the bedside. Um, Nowadays, probably only about 30% of first-time moms or parents attend a childbirth class. And so childbirth educators have been kind of left out of all of this. And it's interesting to me to hear how they are being incorporated in these other dimensions other than the typical six-week class where you go to somebody's house and hang out every week. Um, but doulas, doulas are there um, to fill a gap that isn't provided in most institutionalized maternity care settings which is individualized care and attention. And that, I don't know how you can even put a cost value on that, um, which is one of the dilemmas that doulas face in terms of how do they, um, how are they able to continue to provide this service. Um, but they provide that individual experience and offer information, offer comfort, and keep eyes and ears open for any issues that might arise. Postpartum doulas are also a very important part of the equation, as Joy reminds me. Yeah, I, I think that's so important, and, and um, you know, uh, we fo we I think collectively focus a lot on the cesarean epidemic, and, and at Ovi, it's, it's one of our top priorities. And I think that um, unplanned, uh, as we as we heard earlier, unplanned birth outcomes significantly impact um, women's well-being in that peripartum period. Um, a lot of the, a lot of what determines, hold it closer. A lot of what determines whether a um, delivery ends up being a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery has to do with the um, clinical circumstances and the healthcare provider. Um, but there are three evidence-based um, pieces of, of sort of decision making that the woman can make that will impact her cesarean delivery uh, or impact her risk of cesarean. One is having a plan. Um, two is um, uh, um, certainly choice of provider. I mean, absolutely choice of provider. Uh, so if you choose a midwife, you're much more likely to end up with a vaginal delivery uh, than if you choose a physician. Um, and, and choice of hospital goes along um, with that. Um, but the third one is having a support person. Uh, and um, whether that, that is your 
a, a, an effective partner or, or whether it's a doula, having that support person is, is, is demonstrably effective in um, helping women avoid unnecessary cesareans. So I think your point is just so important. So I'll uh, turn now to our, our final panelist, last but certainly not least. So uh, you've heard about what some of the employers on the panel are doing and, and some suggestions for ways that um, employers and others can support um, moms, new moms and families. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing at Cigna and, and some of the research that you've done? Sure. Yeah, happy to do that. And, and we are absolutely thrilled to be here with all of you today and to be uh, sponsoring this uh, event. So uh, thanks for having me on the stage. And um, let me start by saying as a child psychiatrist that uh, you know, we have uh, known for decades that the most important uh, predictor of child well-being is the well-being of the primary attachment figure. And um, as my two-year-old daughter keeps reminding me, that is the mother <laughs> in most cases. <laughs> so uh, anything we can do at any stage uh, to help moms' well-beings or, or moms-to-be's well-being uh, is critically important. So uh, a lot of what uh, insurance companies, uh, health services companies like Cigna do are uh, coaching and case management programs. Uh, we certainly have one in this space. Uh, healthy pregnancies, healthy babies. Uh, health insurance companies just have massive amounts of data, if you think about it, right? We know when people get sick. Uh, we know when they go to the doctor. We know why they go to the doctor. We know what medications they get. Uh, we know when they're interacting with our apps or our websites in various ways. And so it's not a uh, big leap to take that next step and pick up the phone uh, to call them and say, hey, it looks like you may be uh, needing one thing or another. How can we help get you connected? So that's part of it. Uh, we've been pretty vocal, um, particularly one of our uh, obstetricians, uh, John Keats, who uh, is part of ACOG, and, and uh, we've been strong advocates of screening. Uh, we've said an awful lot about screening. Uh, the good news is it's uh, becoming increasingly prevalent. Uh, our uh, Healthy uh, Pregnancies, Healthy Babies program screens as well. Um, I, you know, the jury's still out, as we've heard today already, on when to screen, uh, how often to screen, but probably more is uh, generally better, so you pick things up. Uh, the other part of what we do, uh, which is critically important, is helping people get access to the care they need. So what do you do if you've screened someone uh, positively? In our uh, accountable care organizations, which are our value-based uh, arrangements where we work with groups of doctors and incentivize them based on how well they take care of entire populations, right? So not just paying for specific services, but how well do they take care of all the patients uh, that are Cigna patients, let's say, in their practice. Um, we are able to, uh, we're doing a pilot right now where we are not only uh, asking them to screen and asking them to refer, but uh, incentivizing them to do that. That's, as we've heard earlier today, uh, uh, typically been unpaid, and it's hard to find the time to do that. So the pilot involves actually paying them to do those assessments and make those uh, referrals. And then the final part of the equation is how do you have the providers available, right? And we've heard about some of the ways that uh, people get stymied in their efforts to get to providers, whether it's a lack of resources, not having a provider, or lack of access, taking the time off of work to get to one, or the stigma of going. And so we've had a huge push recently uh, in the last few years for virtual behavioral health, uh, aka telepsychiatry, uh, to really expand uh, women's abilities to get in when they need to get in. Happy to say more about that, but I'll stop for now. So I want to um, change, change tune a little bit and talk about some of the struggles that insured moms have um, with the healthcare system and with mental health in particular. So we were talking at the table earlier about high deductible health plans and, and the issues around that. Can, we, um, can Melissa and Becky comment on that a little bit more? Um, well, we do happen to have a high deductible health plan, um, and it's, it's our main plan that we offer. Um, we do provide very generous contributions to employees' health savings accounts to help um, fill that gap. Uh, and then I think it's just providing that support leading up to the delivery. We, um, with the direct partnership that we have with that provider system in San Diego, we have put together a bundled um, case rate for maternity, and we publish that rate. So a mom knows, um, you know, from the minute she d um, finds out she's pregnant, she knows exactly what the total cost is for um, a non-complicated birth. 
and she can plan for that. Um, we also have maternity classes to help them in that process and, and planning and budgeting for that. Well, and I think I'm glad to say that the majority of our employees are not in a high deductible health plan. Um, and, and that's uh, for the people that came before me that never really implemented it. And uh, now it appears the tide's turning. The majority of our employees are in a traditional PPO plan. Um, so um, the $250 deductible, and then it's covered. I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, changing tune a little bit again, um, Dr. Morton, I know that something that you are um, very interested in or particularly passionate about is over-medicalized birth. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why doulas came into the field is that they were very concerned um, you know, 20 years ago about the high rate of cesarean. Um, so these are folks who are on the ground and seeing the impact of these unplanned and often to their mind, and as we know now from data that's coming um, out from the CMQCC data center, among others, that a lot of these cesareans are performed um, for reasons that don't have strong medical justification. In other words, there's a great deal of provider discretion around the decision to um, do a cesarean or not. And so um, I think the doulas were very um, inspired by the clinical research trials that suggest they have an impact on cesarean rates when they attend births. Um, a lot of those studies were done in places where standard of care was already pretty bad. And it's not clear to me that the doulas, um, that there's good research to suggest that doulas practicing in most places where women give birth today have that kind of impact. But what they, what they are able to do is educate and um, you know, counsel their clients ahead of time, given that I said not many folks are going to um, childbirth classes, a lot of um, folks don't know what to expect. And so doulas can help women um, avoid, for example, um, long inductions by ask, giving them um, benefits and risks kinds of questions to ask their providers, um, helping them make the decision about what provider to choose. So a lot of times people will start with a doula and she'll give them more information. They'll realize that they don't have the right match in their current provider, and so they'll switch. Um, and with regard to breastfeeding, for example, doulas are very um, effective in helping women breastfeed, which, as we've seen, is, a, is one mechanism by which women can sometimes recapture a piece of their um, maternal experience um, and make it whole. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's interesting to me that doulas were raising the alarm about the C-section rate when it was you know, 25% and we're talking like the, the, the low risk C-section rate, right? And now in, I think in California, there's only maybe about a third to a half of hospitals that meet the Healthy People 2020 um, goal of just 24% of this low risk C-section among first time pregnant women. And so having that metric has also been really important in capturing that. So back to the employers for a moment, um, talking about cesareans and um, the work that many employers are doing on trying to bring those numbers down um, and the, the important role that employers can play in influencing care in general. Um, Melissa, you talked a little bit about the case rates that you have with your local um, facility. Are there other areas, and not necessarily in maternity or, or behavioral health, where you've been able to influence um, local providers or a, a hospital system on how you would like to see care delivered? Um, well, given that we do have that direct relationship with that health system, um, we've really been able to stress to them the areas that are important for us and the areas that we want them to focus on in terms of quality and, and, and quality of the care that's being delivered. Um, maternity is our number one spend, so that is top priority uh, in working with them. And so we've begun those discussions about uh, improving the utilization of midwives within the process. Um, Personally, I, I worked with a midwife for my first pregnancy and, and um, even for my second pregnancy, even though I had to deliver uh, with an OB, I had a midwife there acting as a doula. And so I know how uh, impactful that can be in a successful um, pregnancy and delivery. So we're, we really um, are working closely with that provider system to try and make that available to all of our moms. 
And Becky as well, do you work with local hospital systems? I know you have a concentration of folks in San Jose and in Salt Lake City. Um, do you do any local work there? Yeah, we, we try to partner with, um, as Melissa said, it's our number one spend as well, um, as it is most employers um, today. Um, and we do try to partner. Um, it does become difficult when you're in all the states um, and outside the US, and I think that's where our partnership with um, Pacific um, PBGH as well as uh, Silicon Valley Employer Forum, we try to work together in uh, with banding together employers talking to the hospital systems, um, but we have relied historically on the health plans to help us navigate this space, um, and I do think that we both find there's gaps in it. Great, thank you. Um, so for Dr. Lustig and Dr. Wolfberg, um, can you share what, you've heard a lot of innovative things that these two employers are doing to address um, maternity and mental health concerns. Do you have experience with other clients and can you share some other examples of things that you've seen employers do in this space? In terms of mental health specifically or just maternity care in general? Oh, and maternity care in general and mental health specifically, sure. do you so, have examples? So on the topic of cesarean, we, we uh, focus on that uh, a lot using some of the same techniques. Uh, we have a, uh, at Ovia, we have a, um, a provider selection service uh, for our clients and we always serve up a midwife. Uh, as well as, as obstetric alternatives, because we do want to encourage midwifery care for um, those patients where it's, it's appropriate. Um, we've also teamed up with the Delivery Decisions Unit uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I think that they refer to themselves as the Stanford of the East um, <laughs> to uh, uh, use um, uh, available data sets, uh, including leapfrog data, to, to serve up um, uh, hospitals in the area that have a low cesarean rate uh, and encourage women to select a provider at a low cesarean rate <coughs> hospital again um, because that's one of the uh, demonstrably effective ways of, of setting someone up to have a, uh, a vaginal delivery when that's appropriate. Um, and, and I think that, that that sort of, we use evidence-based techni evidence techniques, um, but with a, a, a um, with a certain degree of, of, of sort of uh, pushing people in a way that's going to um, lead to the best outcome at the at the lowest cost. Uh, in terms of um, maternal mental health, it's it's mostly around um, screening, identification, destigmatization, and then um, referral. Uh, acknowledging that for many women, um, identifying a mental health care provider who is able uh, to see them um, in a short period of time can be a challenge. Yeah, I'd say you know, one of the things that we're doing at Cigna, and I'll share some other things I've heard about in other places too, are trying to figure out how best to protect the well-being of uh, moms and dads. And so we now have, for example, uh, up to six weeks of caregiver leave, which would cover um, folks like me had we had it when I had my two-year-old. Um, I missed out on it, unfortunately. It's not but worth it to have another time. kid just to get six weeks. You know, I, that's how my wife feels. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Uh, but other things, you know, in many places, uh, when you go back to work, uh, seems to be a, a all or nothing kind of thing, right? And so to the extent that uh, families can afford it, uh, part-time solutions is a way to transition gradually back, of course, or uh, is one option. Uh, work shares, of course, is another. Uh, I'm not supposed to tell you the, the number of people that work at home at Cigna, um, but before we merged with uh, Express Scripts, before we combined, I, I will tell you it was uh, well upwards of a third. Uh, I was one of those. And uh, if you're mostly in front of a machine all day, uh, it can be really nice to, to have that additional uh, flexibility. And uh, it's not that we work less hard most of the time, but we do have that uh, flexibility, which is, is really important. Uh, so those are the kinds of things uh, you know, that I think can be helpful to a, uh, to a new mom or even a, a repeat mother. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is um, 
that you know, if you've ever seen the videos that in the parenting classes that uh, show you breastfeeding and, and how wonderful it is, and, and it's, they're usually filmed through this kind of pink lens with soothing music in the background. And um, in case you didn't know, it, it's not that easy. Um, in, in fact, you know, in, in my family, there were times when I thought I might have had an easier time breastfeeding our kid than my wife did. So there are things there, too, that uh, employers can do. Uh, you know, just giving some thought as to the space that's provided in the work environment. So it doesn't have to be big, right? But it does have to be private. So a conference room, you know, that's not going to work. A bathroom stall doesn't count. Uh, it would be really good to have running water uh, to clean the equipment afterwards. And just basic things like that uh, send a very uh, positive message to women who are struggling in a very challenging time of life. So those are some of the things. I'm going to turn it to audience questions in just a second, but I wanted to ask one last question of the employers, um, leading off of um, what Dr. Lustig was saying about return to work. And you talked about your very generous 12-week um, programs for both moms and dads, um, or both parents, um, post-delivery and, and post-disability. But what do you do when, um, when mom comes back to work, well, and dad? Um, how do you support your employees? We do provide some of those um, things that you described in terms of telecommuting options, um, reduced work weeks, et cetera, but this is definitely an area where we uh, intend to focus in the coming year because we think there's a lot more opportunity there to improve that uh, process for both moms and dads. Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, one of the things that um, we've been working on um, is how mothers and dads do stay connected when they're out, and it's not meaning that they're doing a full-time job, but it, it's that being connected still to the team if they're returning back to work. And as Melissa said, we offer different options, and uh, we do have quite a few employees that work from home and um, can even take part-time status. Um, I think that the biggest challenge, too, is when you come back to the workforce is being able to have the right lactation rooms, uh, being able to have flex time where you can, you know, not everybody arrives, and this is true, not, no, no one arrives in Silicon Valley at 8 a.m. anyway, but, you know, <laughs> 9, 10 o'clock um, is sort of, and then how the work day is kind of formed. And I think that, um, you know, the last piece is really um, having groups of inclusion, and we have new parent groups at all of our locations globally, um, and part of it is to not just talk about the mom's health, but also the dad's. I mean, there's an, a big equation here that if you get the dad on board, you can make a lot of different changes as well and support the mom if you can get the dad to understand what the support really is. So I think there's a whole combination, and we all have a lot of work to do in this space, I think. I think that's very true that employers, I think you two are great examples of the work that's being done around maternity and mental health and return to work and everything else already, but I think we all have a lot more to do. So with that, I'm gonna turn it to questions. Um, what questions do you have for our panel? There's one over behind you. Hi. Hi. Um, Thanks so much, very informative, whoops. Um, I, I'm a pediatrician and um, there are three um, stressors. We talk about fragile families and, and um, how different stressors can push people into, into dysfunction. And there are three main stressors after the baby's born. Um, breastfeeding has been mentioned several times and, or feeding the baby in general. You know, success at that makes you feel much more, you know, um, uh, efficacious and proud of yourself. Failure, of course, has the opposite effect. But then there's also crying and exhaustion. And I think, Carol, you brought that up in terms of your experience. Um, and uh, the reason I just wanted to bring this up because um, while we're talking about um, maternal mental health or paternal mental health as well, um, these same stressors lead to unsafe sleeping practices, obesity, breastfeeding failure, um, marital stress, uh, child abuse, and many other negative factors that have a real impact. And so I just um, encourage a broadening of the discussion to talk about infant sleep and, and crying behaviors and how we can do a better job of improving that. I'm, I'm appreciative of seeing uh, Qualcomm here where um, one of the, one of the um, uh, companies that does provide um, uh, discounted snooze for their employees and we have Google and Facebook and Qualcomm uh, 
Hulu, Snapchat, many, many others. And I think that the, 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 the goal is to really recognize the fact that we have um, uh, not only the opportunity to stop this negatively reinforcing cycle uh, where stressors lead to dysfunction, but to create a positively reinforcing cycle where success leads to improved bonding and confidence. Hi there, um, my name is Megan, and I, I guess I'm a unicorn because I'm a maternal mental health specialist. Uh, I'm a psychologist, and I take insurance. So, um, yay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, I think that we can all agree that we've done a wonderful job in improving our screening in the medical setting and acknowledging that women need help and that we're looking at the real data, which is great. And I think you guys all as um, employers are doing an excellent job of doing support services like lactation rooms and you know, breast, breast milk pumping, well, I'm pregnant, mater pregnancy brain, um, <laughs> providing extra leave for parents and things like that. You guys are doing a wonderful job, but I think where the gap in the linkage occurs is kind of what people have been saying, is that it's hard to get your people to people like me. And there's a couple of reasons why, and a lot of it has to do with costs. So just to illustrate, a lot of you guys reflected on the fact that doulas are amazing, and they sure as heck are. They're one of the greatest frontiers that we have against reducing postpartum depression and anxiety. A doula in Orange County, where I am, is one to $2,000 out of pocket, okay? And it's not covered by insurance. You may get a few insurance companies that might reimburse after the fact, but a mom has to still come up with that money up front. So how are you guys helping with that? And then second, <clears throat> a private pay rate for a therapist with my specialty, the rate that insurance provides is 50% of that. So how are we supposed to make a living when you guys are linking to us, we're not, you're ha having a trouble finding <laughs> providers because you're not paying them their work. So how are you going to help that? <laughs> you know, I, I could be wrong. It might be my sort of psychiatric sense, but I have a, just an intuition that that question was partly directed at me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, Thanks for standing up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, all good points. And, and let me start with the last issue first. Uh, if, if at any point it, it feels like the rates that you're receiving from insurance companies, uh, whether it's Cigna or any other, uh, aren't commensurate with what they should be, uh, either in your market or based on your experience, uh, you should come and talk to us and say, okay, I'd like to renegotiate this. And uh, that's, that's the first step. The, the response you get um, depends partly on what the market looks like, um, as well as other factors, uh, how many patients you're seeing, for example, from the insurance company. But that's always the first step. You know, you should, uh, is, well, we'll pretend this isn't being recorded. And I'll, I'll just <laughs> tell you that, uh, you know, insurance companies uh, go to markets with uh, rates that uh, some people will accept, other people's won't. Other people won't, but there's always the opportunity to uh, to negotiate. Um, with doulas, that's not something that um, that Cigna cur uh, currently covers. We do have a new policy uh, which does cover uh, midwifery at various uh, levels of uh, training and credentialing. Uh, so that is now something part uh, that, that's part of uh, what we cover. Uh, doulas, not so much. It's always a difficult decision. Uh, whether to cover something, and it depends, uh, I think, as you were alluding to, in part on uh, what the outcomes are, uh, as well as what the safety is. Um, I can tell you personally, my sister used a doula uh, for at least one, if not her, both of her pregnancies, uh, and found it to be incredibly supportive and helpful. Um, separate issue from whether or not insurance covers it, but uh, it certainly see the value there. Sure. Um, just one thing from IBM. So uh, IBM employer, we have a, a fund, our, our family health care fund, that uh, will reimburse up to $50,000 for things that the traditional health care plan doesn't cover. It's a taxable benefit because it's not you know, what would normally be covered by the health plan, but it addresses all kinds of issues that, um, that aren't covered by, by an insurer. And so that's a, a one way that some employers are able to address that kind of issue. So I have a question here. Um, I'm concerned with the growth of the gig economy. So if we look at Google, who has 50% of their workforce are contractors. 
Um, and I think that that trend is probably increasing in many sectors, not just in tech. So we have people here who are buying their insurance on the open market. Um, and uh, so I'm concerned about how we're talking about you know, a, a shrinking population of the workforce that are being employed and getting their benefits through work. What happens with the gig economy? I think it's a it's a good point. It's things that employers aren't addressing through um, through the health plan because they're not covered on our health plans. But I think um, some progressive employers are looking at what they can do for all of their workforce, whether they are tra traditional employees or contractors. But I think we have an opportunity to work with the health plans too that are not covering that are covering these contingent workers, these contract workers, to make sure that the things that we all believe in. Um, are covered um, even on the exchanges. And at rates that are, I mean, we don't have the bargaining power. Yeah. When you're a contractor, you don't have the bargaining power of 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 employees. And so that em employers that are using contractors should at least, if they're not going to pull people in as employees, advocate on their behalf with the insurance companies. And if the insurance company could speak to put you in the hot seat about you know, what happens to folks that are, you know, on the open market. Yeah, so say a little bit more. I just want to be sure I completely understand the question. You're, you're, by contractors, you're talking about? Non-employees, uh, yeah. right, mm -hmm. who have to get their health insurance. They have to uh, buy as okay. independent. They're not part of a pool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have a g good answer for that um, uh, other than sympathy for people who are part of that economy. And I... I, I don't get my own insurance that way, but I, we have we rent out our uh, downstairs on Airbnb, so we're part of that gig economy. Um, and I, you know, my wife uses Uber all the time, so so we get it. Um, and it is uh, actually surprising to me how little Uber drivers are actually paid when you talk to them, um, and and what their expenses are. So um, you know, I would wonder about collective bargaining or organizations or uh, groups such as uh, the California Business Group on Health, uh, groups that have been able to pull together coalitions for that purpose. Um, and I don't know specifically what they would have to offer uh, such contractors, but I, I think they're deserving of, of, of good rates too. I think this um, will take two more questions. So I have a question about the history of flex time. Because it seemed that something, um, something changed with that. I, I have been a, um, a, a birth and postpartum doula for over 17 years. And I guess I should have been charging more money than that. We don't, I, I haven't ever charged that much. But what I noticed is something changed in the 80s, 90s about flex time because my mom started to say, I, I have to go back to work full time. Can you talk about the dollars and cents and why that changed and why women have a tougher time? I'm hearing over and over again, getting that flex time and sharing it with another buddy at work because most of them say, I have to go back and work my full eight hour um, day now. So is the question, what are employers requiring people to work a yes. full time schedule well, versus? Yes. And, and, I, and, and obviously, you guys are accommodating, but that's not what I hear out in the general public anymore, that something changed with flex time. And I'm not aware of anything structural that's changed. Um, I think often uh, you can't get benefits if you don't work at least 30 and sometimes even, well, 30 hours now. Yeah. And we do provide benefits for those working 20 or more hours a week. Yeah, yeah. and we do as well. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help you with that one. Okay, and last question is right here. So we talked a lot today about um, maternal mental health, including not just maternal depression, but also PTSD and traumatic birth, um, and the experience of women as if that is the only risk factor, so to speak, for the microphone. I can yeah. talk louder. No, we're going to hear you on the way. So we talked a lot today about maternal mental health uh, and the experience of women as if that, to some degree, is the only risk factor in their history uh, that 
is leading to these challenges. And now we're talking about work and returning to work as if that's another risk factor. So I'm a pediatrician and I research adverse childhood experiences and the intergenerational transmission of trauma and adversity. So I'm curious if in your work and looking at your employees and who you hire, because we're actually looking at this for our own staff in our organization at the Center for Youth Wellness where I work, if you're looking at whether there are folks in your office who are already predisposed to have maternal mental health concerns or paternal health concerns based on their histories and whether or not that's kind of coming up, you might be aware in the state of California, we're about to look a lot at adverse childhood experiences across children and adults. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that or have thought about that for your employees and how that might affect their risk for having challenges when they return to work or having parenting challenges and what we could do about it. I'll take that to start. I, I don't have a great answer, but I love the question. Uh, so to, to, to vine ACEs, these are the kinds of things, right, that happen to uh, kids at, at a young age or even an older age, and they could be uh, physical, sexual abuse, uh, divorce of a parent, death of a parent, uh, uh, living with someone with uh, mental or severe physical illness in the home. Uh, so all of these, and, and there are eight or ten of these things that have been predictive of uh, future adversity uh, and are, as you, you know, correctly point out, uh, risk factors for uh, difficulty in, in, the, in the peripartum period with postpartum depression. So uh, really important to think about. Um, the other uh, research question I think that's inherent in what you're talking about is uh, looking at the impact of uh, not just uh, difficulties with postpartum depression, but uh, subclinical uh, mood disorders and anxiety disorders, because those have also been shown uh, in kids, as you well know probably, uh, to have cognitive uh, impacts, nutritional impacts, other physical adverse uh, outcomes, emotional outcomes as well. Uh, so there's really a host of uh, considerations. The re reason I love the question is because I keep going back to my earlier comment about how uh, health services companies have such massive amounts of data. And could we potentially, um, and I don't know the answer, but I'm thinking aloud as we're talking about, you know, could we pull that uh, potentially? Would we be able to figure out who has had difficulties earlier on and then uh, potentially do some predictive modeling? We are good at predictive modeling. Uh, getting the, the, the right predictors um, a priori is sometimes a challenge, but it, it's a really interesting question. Yeah, thank you for that. I just, to, just to follow up real quick, what concerns me most about this is sometimes we're trying to fix the wrong problem. So a lot of what you're offering your employees is dependent on their ability to form secure relationships, let's say, with their colleagues right, or their supervisor. But we're not acknowledging that there's something else there that might actually mean they can't, and we just think of that person as the reserved person in the workplace or the person who explodes in the middle of a meeting, right? And we're not actually acknowledging that when they return to work, a lot of what we're suggesting won't work because we don't actually know the underlying causes and challenges in their life that make them still struggle with these challenges. Great. And with that, I'm getting the hook signed. So th I'd like to thank our panel very much. I really appreciate the time that you took today to talk about how employers can support our great work. Thank you. Well, it's been a really great day. Um, we want to thank each of you. We're also providing you with one of these books by Karen Kleiman. Even great, or good mothers have scary thoughts. Um, there's also a gift card here from a new um, partner that's working with 2020 Mom that has a cake shop here in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Um, and we forgot to give those to our other speakers, but we're excited to, to have a little fun uh, with, with those um, gift cards as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, as we wrap up today, we wanted to tell you just a little bit about how 2020 Mom is looking ahead in uh, the year 2019 uh, to the year 2020. And uh, a couple of things that I wanted to share with you is that we're hosting um, the fourth annual Hill Day in DC, which has been uh, rebranded this year as Mom Congress. 
And there are some flyers in the back. I'm going to hold it up here. But we um, welcome and encourage all of you who want to go deeper in advocacy to join us. Um, and if you have been to DC with us in the past, raise your hand. Um, the, the folks that are here can tell you just how life changing it is to get to learn uh, how to change laws and really make a difference in this very impactful way. A couple of the things that are brewing from a legislative front include um, addressing mental health parity. Uh, we heard from a few of you today that um, payment parity is as important as out-of-pocket cost parity, right? These are things that are being addressed through federal legislation uh, in uh, DC and also state legislation this year in California. Um, I also want to share with you uh, that <coughs> we're very much interested in, we, we get the pleasure of um, hosting the symbol, the blue dot, through a project and a separate website called the blue dot project .org. Um, the Blue Dot was selected by a group of organizations that were a part of the National Coalition for Maternal Mental Health as the international symbol for survivorship, those who support mothers, et cetera. Um, Postpartum Support International, a sister nonprofit, actually held the contest to select the symbol. We get the pleasure, as I mentioned, of hosting this website. We want people to know that this does not belong to any one organization and that we want to see all of you use the blue dot in a really big way this year and next year and make it like the pink ribbon, right? We are more, uh, more there's higher prevalence of maternal mental health disorders than there are uh, breast, can breast cancer rates, so let's make it bigger than the pink ribbon together. Can I get a round of applause? Yeah. I also wanted to share that um, we are very pr privileged to be working on a study, and Lisa um, is in the back here, um, the researcher that is uh, supporting the study also with partners in Arizona, studying um, the value of peer supporters in this space. Some of you may have heard about uh, the term certified peer specialist. Uh, they are utilized um, in other uh, areas, for example, um, Veterans work with certified peer specialists. Uh, we know that those that um, have um, challenges with alcohol and substance use um, can utilize and lean on peer supporters. And we're very interested in learning how we can leverage the knowledge in that system of certified peer specialists around maternal mental health. The study will be released um, later this year. And I wanted to share that uh, we focused on two areas. Um, that uh, s uh, some folks in the room helped identify um, hot, what we call hot spots for postpartum depression. Um, and there are cities and areas in the US where census data helps, um, helps uh, predict where we're going to have the highest rates of maternal mental health disorders. Uh, the two top cities are Houston, uh, where Kay is from, and also Phoenix. Right next to her, we have someone from Phoenix. And so we're studying the use of peer supporters in those two markets so that we can most immediately um, provide resources there. So more to come on how um, that model can be utilized. What we like about that model, um, let me just say, is that all states except California and I think one of the Dakotas, and California is changing, reimburse certified peer specialists for their time through their Medicaid program. So again, another way to sustain um, access to uh, services. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll share, um, I think those in California will especially appreciate that we know now that this legislation has passed that requires screening, that we, um, in addition to, to um, building up uh, support through peer support um, specialists, also are very much interested in proliferating support group uh, access. So if you're interested in learning more about support groups, um, we have three models. Uh, one that we have already rolled out uh, from our partners from Postpartum Support Virginia. Um, several of you were in, in the training yesterday. Um, and then we're also looking at the mother and babies model that is housed out of Northwestern University, developed here in California at UCSF, um, and really a great model um, for Latina populations. 
And then we're working with um, Kay Matthews to talk about how do we serve uh, African American women in a powerful way and meet them where they uh, want services. So look for, uh, forward to seeing more about that strategy uh, here in California and um, beyond. And I am also um, going to turn it over to Apple in just a moment. But before I do, you heard her say at the start of our program that she is not only our board chair and working multiple jobs professionally, but she also was the chair of this conference. So if you could please give her a round of applause along with me to say thank you. We almost just kissed on the lip. <laughs> I do love you, but okay. <laughs> So let's have fun. Um, we have a text polling um, session. So if you want to um, participate in this uh, in this um, text poll, text 2020 mom to 22333 on your iPhones or phones. So I'm doing it right now. Everyone open up a text. Access, progress, disparity. Unbreakable, support, birth trauma, single payer now, <laughs> PTSD, shortages, access, progress. <laughs> On that note, we thank you all so much for being a part of this maternal mental health family. We hope that we'll see you again next year. And for those of you that are working in hospital, um, hospital systems now, remember that the Learning Network will be launching this summer. And we invite you to join us there to learn together and share uh, uh, and hear webinars, et cetera. Thank you again, Apple, for being our chair. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us online as well. <laughs>